The Ohio Shakespeare Quarantine Radio Program starts now. Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Avon Corto, and welcome to the Ohio Shakespeare Quarantine Radio Program, where we produce original works based on classic stories for your at-home entertainment. So grab your quarantine pal, your favorite adult beverage, or maybe a glass of chocolatey Ovaltine for the kiddos, and settle in for some old-fashioned radio play spookums. Tonight's holiday tale is based on the classic novella by Charles Dickens, adapted for our radio program by Nancy Cates. It is sure to remind us that everything we say and do in life, no matter how small, can add up into unexpected consequences. Joining us tonight from the Ohio Shakespeare Festival Company are Terry Burglar as Scrooge, Ryan Zarecki as Bob Cratchit, Maya Nicholson as Mrs. Cratchit, Mrs. Dilbers, Woman, Jeremy Jenkins as Fred, Richard Figgy as Undertaker, Man, Andreas Varner Waltz as Boy in the Street, M.J. Ross as Belinda, James Rankin as The Businessman, Peter Cratchit, Derek Winger as Old Joe, Madeline Hayes as Martha, The Laundress, and Holly Humes as The Narrator. Previously on A Christmas Carol. Enter, Ebenezer Scrooge. Come in. Come in and know me better, man. And who are you, pray? I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. (laughs) Have you never seen the like of me before? Never. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, my elder brothers born in recent years? I don't think I have. I'm I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800. Oh, a tremendous family to provide for. (laughs) Come with me. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forward last night upon compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe and go with me. Who are these people, spirit? Know you not the family of the man who has worked for you, lo, these many years? Bob Cratchit? Are all these children his spirit? They are his joy. (laughs) 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 He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. He believed it too. Why, it's my nephew Fred. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge! Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Go! Thank you! Thank you all! My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark! My time is at hand. Look Look to see see me me no more! more. Farewell, spirit. I I will remember you. I will remember you! Time traveling with ghosts always leaves me feeling like I've run a marathon. Whenever I get caught up in that, I like to reach for a handcrafted, small batch Bar of soap stamped with my favorite literary quotations. Look no further than our friends at the Macbeth for that. Gee, Mabel, you sure got a real tight grip on that Christmas tree there. It's the sap, Elma. I'm stuck. Go get the soap. But this is that really nice soap from the Macbeth. Well, it's still great soap, Elma. Oh, no, but not that one. That's a gift set for Aunt Mildred. You got the soap as a gift. Oh, yes. The Macbeth offers loads of gift sets for the holiday season. Soaps, tinted lip balms, bath bombs, lotions, and face masks. And they can all be gift wrapped before they ship to save you all that runaround and... 
hullabaloo. Well, that sounds super helpful, seeing as we can't see Mildred this year because of the typhoid fever, which definitely isn't a stand-in for a less contemporaneous epidemic. But they still all have themes from your favorite classic works of literature. I know that's a deal-breaker for Mildred. You bet they do. Gift sets themed around the Grinch, the Polar Express, and the Christmas Carol make a cozy holiday present. Ah, wonderful. My hands are clean as a whistle now. Well, glad to help. I'll let you get back to decorating that tree. And all the rest of the Christmas shopping. And housework. And child care. Well, thank heavens for the Macbeth. Find something for even the most bedraggled of bibliophiles at themacbath.com. That's T-H-E-M-A-C-B-A-T-H dot com. And now, Ohio Shakespeare Festival presents Stave 4 of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. The very air through which this spirit moved seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. Scrooge felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit observed his condition and paused a moment, giving him time to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, while he could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply, but pointed the hand straight before them. Lead on. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. But there they were, in the heart of it, amongst the merchants who hurried up and down and chinked the money in their pockets and conversed in groups and looked at their watches as Scrooge had seen them do often. The spirit stopped before the bank, beside a little knot of businessmen, Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. Well, old Scratch has finally got his own at last, eh? Yes, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. Well, when did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I, I thought he'd never die. God knows. Well, what has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. (laughs) He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For a part of my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if lunch is provided, but I must be fed if I'm to make an appearance. (laughs) (laughs) Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to a conversation so trivial, but feeling assured that there must be some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself to whom he could apply it. 
but nothing doubting that there was some latent moral for his own improvement, he resolved to treasure up every word he heard and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed and would render the solution to the riddle. He looked about for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner. And though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for banking, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes in the lobby. It gave him little surprise, though, for he had been resolving in his mind a change of life, and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Quiet and dark beside him stood the phantom with its outstretched hand. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. Alleys and archways, like so many cesspools, disgorged their offenses of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuse iron of all kinds. Secrets that few would like to scrutinize were bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupted fat, and sepulchres of bones. Sitting in among the wares he dealt in was a gray-haired rascal, at least seventy years of age, who had screened himself from the cold air without by a frowsy curtaining of miscellaneous tatters hung upon a line, and smoked his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it, well, I'm not afraid to go first. Let the laundress be the second, and the undertaker's man be third. You couldn't have met in a better place. Come into the parlour. You three ain't no strangers to it. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Oh, how it screaks. There ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place as his own inches, I believe. And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. <laughs> <laughs> We're all suitable to our calling. We're well matched. Uh, come into the parlour. Come into the parlour. Oh, what odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilba? Every person has the right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true, indeed. No man more so. Very well, then. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? <laughs> Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw. Why, what any more natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone by himself. It's the truest word that was ever spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wished it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it. Oh, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid for them to see it. We all know pretty well we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. Sheets, towels, silver teaspoons, <laughs> sugar tongs, boots, sleeve buttons. Right, here's your account. I always give too much to the ladies. That's the way I ruin myself. Hey, yeah. Say now, what do you take me for? You ask for another penny, I'll repent of being so liberal, and knock off half a crown. <clears throat> and now undo my bundle, Joe. <laughs> what do you call this? Bed curtains? Aye, bed curtains. 
You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him lying there? Yes, I do. Why not? <laughs> you were born to make your fortune, and you'll certainly do it. <laughs> and what have you to show, Undertaker? Ah, oh, I certainly shouldn't hold back my hand for the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe. Not when I can get something by reaching it out. Just look these blankets. His blankets? Who else do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching. Don't you worry about that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look right through that shirt till your eyes ache. But you won't find a hole in it, not a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. So what are you call a wasting of it? Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. Someone was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. <laughs> he can't look uglier than he did in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror as they sat grouped about their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp. He viewed them with a detestation and disgust which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. Spirit, I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might have been my own. My life tends that way now. Oh, merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay a something covered up, which, though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, Unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do, and longed to do it but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the spectre at his side. Spirit, let us go. This is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its presence. Trust me. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, and I would do it if I could. But I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. If there is any man in this town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, Show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed them to be in a small, dark room where stood a man and woman, their faces careworn and depressed, though they were still young. Is it good or bad? Both, I think. Are we quite ruined? No, there is hope yet. If he relents, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting. He is dead. When I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, the charwoman told me he was upstairs as cold as any stone. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time, we shall be ready with the money. And even if we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep tonight with light hearts. Yes, their hearts were lighter, and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. No, spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death, or oh, that dark chamber which we left just now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. 
They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing. But surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. No, spirit! The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes, makes them weak by candlelight. That wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. Must be near his time. Past it, rather. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, Mother. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I. Often. So have I. So have we all. But... He was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. And there is your father at the door. Hello, my dears. Hello, Hello father. Hello, father. Did you see the place he is to lie, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him I would walk there on a Sunday. <laughs> my little child. My little, little child. Oh, Father, please don't be so grieved. No, no, I'm, I'm all right. Oh, I almost forgot. I met Mr. Scrooge's nephew in the street today, and when he saw that I looked just a little down, you know, he inquired what happened to distress me, on which, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you have ever heard, I told him. I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. My dear, from his kind way, it really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul. You'd be sure of it, my dear, if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be at all surprised if he might arrange a better situation for Peter. Only hear that, Peter. And then Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you. It's just as likely as not, one of these days, though there's plenty of time for that later. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor Tiny Tim, shall we? or this first parting that there was among us. Never, 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 father. never father. father. And I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a tiny, little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. Of never, course father. not. Never, 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 father. Not. I am very happy. I am very happy. You know, we've had a lot of fun the last few weeks with these ad throws, but we want to slow down and get serious for a moment. These last few months have been challenging for everyone, and we have been the recipients of untold amounts of love and support from a number of different sources. We want to take a moment and say thank you to some of them specifically. Here to say a few words is our managing director, Tess Bergler. Dear listeners and friends, this is Tess Bergler, Managing Director and Acting Company Member at Ohio Shakespeare Festival. The pandemic hit right in the middle of our performances of St. Joan, and that for me meant right in the middle of playing the dream role of Joan of Arc on my own stage. Not long after that, I voluntarily furloughed myself, along with many of our other staff, to keep the shuttered theater afloat. And with the short exception of our outdoor production of Complete Works this summer at Stan Hewitt, I have been unemployed since then. I won't lie, it's been hard for many reasons, not the least of which is that I don't get to work serving the community through running this wonderful theater. And mine is only one of millions of similar stories from people across the world right now. But these radio plays have been a refuge, a way to serve the community and a way to explore and expand my artistic horizons. 
And I know that the 60 plus otherwise out of work artists who have worked for the Ohio Shakespeare Quarantine radio program feel the same way. I'm very proud of these works from the talented playwrights, all of whom are Ohio Shakespeare Company members, to the actors, sound designers, production managers, and directors, I truly believe that the quality of these radio plays accurately reflects the beauty our theater is capable of. I wanted to take a moment to personally thank those of you who directly helped make possible these last six months of radio play broadcasting. There are simply too many of you to name in this brief moment, but to everyone who has donated through the website or over the phone, and to our patrons who donate monthly to this program at patreon.com, please know that I am personally and deeply thankful. And particularly, we wanted to thank Partners for Theater, whose generous grant helped underwrite all our quarantine radio program. True to their mission of connecting the community to local theater, Partners for Theater stepped up in our hour of need and helped us provide these free at-home radio plays for our loyal patrons. Thanks, thanks, PFT, and ever thanks. With the vaccine on the horizon, our live theater can begin to imagine the process of reopening. There is a light at the end of this tunnel. But until then, please wear your masks, stay home whenever possible, and we'll be together again soon. And now, the conclusion of Stave 4 of A Christmas Carol. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, though at a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on as to the end just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. Ah, this court is where my place of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the building. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped, but the hand was pointed elsewhere. The building is yonder. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and accompanied it until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering. A churchyard, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite. A worthy place. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge. Oh! Am I that man who lay upon the bed? The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit! Oh, no, no! Scrooge clutched tightly at its robe, but the finger remained. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I would have been but for this meeting. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows that you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. 
The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, Scrooge saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrank, collapsed, and dwindled down into... a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends oh, in. My bed curtains! They're not torn down! They're not torn down! Rings and all! They're here! I am here! The shadow of things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, oh, Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. He tried to dress, and his hands were busy with his garments, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Oh, oh, I'm giddy as a drunken man. Oh, merry. Christmas to everybody, a happy new year to all the world. He had frisked into the sitting room and was now standing there, perfectly winded. Uh, uh, there, there, there. Oh, there's a sauce. There's a saucepan that the gruel was in. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. And there's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. Oh, it's all right. It's all true. <laughs> it all happened to my... <laughs> Really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. I don't know what day of the month it is. <laughs> I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. <laughs> Never mind. I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist. Clear, bright, jovial, stirring, cold. Golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. Hello there, boy. Whoop. Hello. What's today? Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. Oh, they could do anything they like. Of course they can. <laughs> of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello? Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I do. Oh, an intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as May? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Walker! No, no, I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here that I may give them direction where to take it. Now come back with the man, and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. Oh! <laughs> I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, and he shan't know who sent it. <laughs> it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Scrooge washed and dressed all in his best. Shaving was not an easy task, for his hand shook, and shaving requires attention, even when you don't dance while you are at it. But the tasks were accomplished somehow, and Scrooge headed downstairs to the street door to venture out. As he passed, the door knocker caught his eye. Oh, I shall love it as long as I live. I scarcely ever looked at it before. It's a wonderful knocker. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. 
and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far, when coming on towards him he beheld the gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before, and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sirs, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sirs. Mr. Scrooge? Oh, yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to... Uh, I, I, uh, I Here, Scrooge to... whispered in his ear. Lord bless me, my dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? Will oh, you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favour? My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such... <laughs> well, well, don't say anything, please. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? We will. We will. Thank you. Oh, I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that any thing could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my girl? Yes, sir. Oh, such a nice girl. A lovely girl. <laughs> Where is he, my dear? He's in the dining room, sir, along with the mistress. Thank you. He knows me. Uh, I'll see myself in. Oh, uh, uh, here's something for your trouble. Thank you, sir. Merry Christmas, sir. <coughs> um, uh, Fred? Why, oh, bless my soul. Who's that? It is I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece and little fan looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party. Wonderful games. Wonderful happiness. <laughs> Scrooge was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. Bob's hat and scarf were off before he opened the door. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello! What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, and therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. Oh. <laughs> merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> oh, a merrier Christmas, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavour to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a smoking bowl of Christmas punch. 
Go, oh, make up the fires. Oh, and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. He had no further traffic with spirits, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. This concludes tonight's broadcast of A Christmas Carol, Stave 4, adapted for our radio production by Nancy Cates, from the classic novella by Charles Dickens. We would also like to recognize Technical Director Buddy Taylor, Managing Director and Sound Designer Tess Burglar, and Trevor Buda for writing and creating the original theme music for the Quarantine Radio Program. Ohio Shakespeare is dedicated to creating these all-original classic radio plays throughout the remainder of 2020, Look for them live on our Facebook page each month. You can also listen to them at any time thereafter on our website at www.ohioshakespeare.com or find them at soundcloud.com slash ohio-shakespeare-festival. These radio plays will remain free to the public and Ohio Shakespeare will continue to pay our collaborating artists. If you would like to support these efforts, please consider joining our Patreon. All monies raised on our Patreon platform go right back into paying local actors and playwrights to produce these all-original radio productions. Visit patreon.com slash ohioshakes. That's www.patreon.com slash ohioshakes. Tune in next time for our January show, Lady Molly of Scotland Yard. Until then, this is Avon Quarto saying, Good night. <laughs>